I'm Indeed PJ. I am the CTO and founder of uh, Theo. I'm the guy that was responsible for writing the first player code, which now the engineering team has lots of fun with. Um, but I'm also the guy that um, thought that it was a good idea to make uh, HESP, an ultra low latency streaming protocol, which kind of works. Um, but that's not what we're talking about um, today. We're going to talk about debugging, how it's awful, um, because, well, video pipelines can be very, very complex, but I don't have to explain that here. Um, and I'm going to start explaining why it's always the player's fault. Um, that's just what it is. Um, after that, I'll tell you why your analytics dashboards are giving you a false sense of security, because when you're debugging, you usually cannot really do anything with them. And beyond that, um, after that, I'm going to explain why testing in production is the way to go. But it's always the video player's fault. Um, why is that? Well, video pipelines, they're complex. There's a lot of moving parts. But whenever there is something that breaks, in the end, the end result is that your user is looking at a spinner, looking at a glitch, or looking at a broken video screen somewhere. Um, that's a big issue, and we develop players, so usually at that point in time, customers come to us, and we have to fix it. We have to figure out what is really going on here. Um, not really easy, and in the end, the end result is usually it is not somewhere with the player, but the player can actually fix it in a lot of cases. Um, in our player, we have tons of fixes which go above and beyond the complexity that Dash or HLS already bring out of the box. And you have workarounds for encoder issues, for timestamp issues, which probably the Mux team can use now as well. Um, but there's, there's all kinds of things that you can work around in the player just to try and improve that user experience. Um, but let's look at some examples. And the first case um, that I would want to talk to you about is a case where we had a customer and they had a massive amount of video playback failures. Um, only solution that they had, if this happened in the field, the only solution was restart the stream, reset the player, go again. Um, not really the user experience that you're normally looking for. Um, so we dug into it. And we started looking like what kind of thing is going on here. And it turned out that whenever the video player was throwing an error, just before the moment in time when that happened, we noticed that the segments which were coming in, they were actually not going to the location where they should go. Um, they were going to the buffer in some completely different place, triggering a stall, triggering in the end an error as well. That was not very cool. Um, not very straightforward either, because when you looked at it, one client session could be perfectly fine other client session looking at exactly the same content at exactly the same time, no problem whatsoever, or, well, problem depending on which user you were. What was the problem here? Um, we started to really look into it, and in the end, we managed to reproduce this, because that's usually step number one. Some cases it works, some cases you basically cannot reproduce at all, um, but more on that later. And in this case, what we noticed was that when we compared the two segments that these clients were getting, they were completely different. Different size, different frames, different frame durations, different PTS timestamps. So there you go. Like, that's the cause of why it's going into the buffer on the wrong spot. But then the question was, why is this happening? Why is this? Why are we suddenly getting a completely different segment which has the same video frames but not the same timestamp. The reason there was that our customer was like, oh yes, um, we have two encoders for resilience, primary and backup, primary and backup origin, but these are perfectly in sync. Turned out not to really be the case. Um, and even if they would be out of sync, we have this very nice load balancer with sticky sessions implemented there, and that should keep all the users on the session that they need to be. Um, turned out that that load balancer was like, whatever, we'll swap somebody at a random point in time. Very fun, uh, very good. Um, encoders desynced, so in the end, everything went, uh, went crazy. And we had to implement some kind of detection that we could figure out that this was happening and shift the segments forward. All kinds of cool things. Um, but I think the real 
problem here is when we went into this problem, we were completely blind. We did not know that there was this architectural setup with two encoders and all that kind of stuff. Because if we had known, the first thing we would have done is check if these encoders were in sync, get streams from both encoders, play it out, and then probably you would have solved this quite quickly. Um, didn't happen like that, so we wasted quite a lot of time. Now that's just one kind of sample where you could see things going wrong and going wrong quite significantly. But there was another fun one that I actually wanted to talk about. And yeah, I know that the circle is kind of useless because you can see that something, something bad is going on here. Um, and the problem that was going on here was the point in time when stuff went wrong. That was actually the point in time when they deployed a new version of their application with a new version of the player in there. So probably the player's fault. Can't really blame them from thinking that. Um, the big problem that we had was when we tried to reproduce it, we couldn't. Or customer couldn't either. Um, couldn't reproduce it in production app, couldn't reproduce it in testing environment, couldn't reproduce it anywhere. Um, only thing that we had was this analytics dashboard that was telling us buffering has gone up for some reason. And obviously they rolled back almost immediately, or at least after a few hours, things were fixed. So. Clearly, clearly high cor correlation there. Um, what did we do? We started looking at what can we do? Can, can't reproduce it. Sometimes it is really at the start of a session. Sometimes it takes like a few hours before a session has this kind of the buffering issues. Didn't appear to be anything related to ABR. Didn't appear to be any kind of straws that we could grasp. Um, so we started wondering, if we cannot see this issue in production, is it then maybe the analytics dashboard that's bad? I mean, can we trust the data? Can we trust the graphs that we are seeing here? Um, the answer was no. Um, what we have is we have this, this testing framework in our office. It has a bunch of, of different physical devices, smart TVs, tablets, smartphones, bit of everything. Um, they're all hooked up into a network. We can run automated tests on it. It's quite fun, probably worth a different TMUX talk. Um, but we used this and we actually took the analytics plugin that our customer was using. They were using an open source plugin built by the actual vendor of that analytics system. I will not name them. Um, and we put it in our testing system, ran it right next to um, our normal automated tests, run a bunch of scenarios, and what it turned out was that there were a few issues. Um, first issue that we noticed relatively quickly was when we were doing a load call, their video start time already started running. So if we had customers who had like a video down on a page somewhere, you would preload it, huge video startup time, not really ideal. Um, but also what they were doing is something like this. Um, they were actually estimating when a stall was happening. So they had a timer every X milliseconds. They would fire that timer, check how much time in the current time has elapsed since the last check-in. Um, not the most ideal way to do this, but well, Phil might actually be thinking, hey, that's something that PJ told me at one point in time as well, because they were doing it as well. Um, but this is something that's, that's actually surprisingly common in, uh, in some of the analytics plugins that I've seen. Um, but we figured, well, this might be the cause of what we are seeing here. So we did some pull requests on that plugin. We fixed it, changed it, put it in production, and it didn't solve anything. Well, it solved the startup time thing, but it didn't really solve the problem that we had here. Um, the one good thing that it did for us was it showed us that the data was a little bit cleaner. And as a result, we found that the platforms where we were seeing this issue was the Android platform and usually on the low end device. So that already gave us some kind of clue. And together with the customer and one of their viewers who was having these issues, and he reported that he was having issues, we were able to get our hands on, let's say, the magical phone where we could reproduce some kind of stall on that device. Um, so our team was like, OK, great, let's start profiling, optimizing, make sure that this runs smooth. 
a lot of time went over that because it's not really simple to do that. It's not something that you can do uh, one day to the next. Um, but in the end, a few sprints later, great. Everything was running smooth on this device. A lot of performance improvements, a lot of tweaks done. Talk to our customer like, hey, we have this great new version of the player. We're relatively sure that it's going to fix the problem that you're having. So let's put it in production. And we put it in production, and the numbers were still bad. Um, still no fix. Um, not really what you want, not really what the customer wanted. So at that point in time, they started getting, let's say, a little bit upset. Um, up until that point that the customer actually told us, like, I'm going to ask my application team to see how much time this will take to actually swap, because we really need a fix for this problem. Not really what we wanted either, so we went back, tried to fix some stuff. But it wasn't needed because about a day later or a few days later, suddenly that customer let us know, hey, good news, everything is fixed. We're live with the latest version of the player. Dashboards are looking great, better than ever. We were like, wait, what? <laughs> we didn't do anything. We, we, we didn't change anything. So what had happened here? Um, the customer's application team went in, they looked at their code, and they realized we have created a massive memory leak here. Um, so accidentally, without only swapping the player, they had added some kind of feature, even though they told us at the beginning they had only changed the player, but they had also added some feature there, something EPG-related, massive memory leak, um, massive impact. If you had the app open for a longer amount of time, slow sessions all around, next playback, same problem, close the app, kill it, burn it with fire, next time everything works. So perfect data, perfect stats at that point in time. Everybody happy is what you would think. But there again, I mean, it was quite clear. I mean, you should really have something if you are debugging. You should really have something that you can rely on. You, you shouldn't be going in blind completely based on some KPI on an analytics dashboard. Um, and if there's a few things that I would advise to everybody, things that you should really remember is a first thing that you should really do is make sure that you connect, collect the right data. It's not just about collecting a lot of data, but it's really about collecting the right data. And everybody and their mother, or at least that's what it feels like for me, they have their own analytics system. In a lot of companies, there's an analytic system for the advertisement people, there's one for the ops people, there's one for the encoding people, there's one for the op. There, there's way too many analytic systems, but they're all collecting play event, pause event, buffer event. Yeah, that's it. We can draw a QoE metric based on that. But if you're really debugging, it's about buffer sizes. It's about network behavior. It is about PTS timestamps. It is about when are things being appended to the buffer. It is about where are the discontinuities. And this kind of information, most people are not collecting. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we see it in our, in our test automation system. If you collect all of that data, it is a lot of data. Um, you're going to be creating a memory leak in some application as well. So you don't really want to always log that kind of amount of data. But it is something which can really be a treasure trove of information if you are debugging. Um, a very good approach that I've seen, at least, is just make sure that you can enable it, even if it is for specific sessions. Just make sure that you have this magical flag somewhere, like for all of the iOS devices with Safari doing fair play or whatever, we're now going to log like 1% of the users get their stack. And if we bump into an issue, then we can at least see what is really going on there. Um, that's one thing which I've at least learned is hugely interesting to have as a capability in your, in your system. Um, but also, next to that, really make sure that you just know what's going on. This is really something that can save you a lot of time. And I know that for a lot of companies, it is actually very difficult because there's different encoding team, there's a different packaging team, ads team, DRM team, CDN player, you name it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of teams in some companies um, and they don't always communicate very well. But if you bump into these kind of issues, quickest thing, get everybody in a room, explain what's going on. They can pull up all of their nice analytics dashboards and explain why the problem is not on their side. 
but maybe they can explain why the problem is with somebody else. Um, that's something that usually works pretty well. Um, and finally, one of the last things that I've learned over the past 11 years um, doing these kind of things is there's no such thing as testing in production. Um, just don't call it testing in production, call it like A-B testing, because then management is gonna be a lot happier compared to calling it testing in production. But there's no way that you can test the complexity of billions of devices, all of the different use cases and people using their phones in a weird way or holding it the wrong way. Um, at some point in time, you will be going into production and the best thing that you can do is be able to do it in a controlled environment. Just roll out smoothly or have like feature flags available. I mean, one case, I've seen it happen a lot of times. And in some cases, the customers were very happy that they had built in a switch to kill DRM at a certain point in time because there was something funky going on. Um, if you don't have that kind of capability, you're kind of out of luck in, uh, in some cases. And these kind of things, it can be really simple with like a Firebase remote config. I mean, we have customers using that, for example, to see if there are new Android devices. They see issues on those devices. They disable or enable specific decoders on the device, and they don't even have to go through the App Store to push a new configuration. Next time a video plays, automatically magic, the right configuration is there. They hadn't seen the device before, now they have. Very simple, but it's these kind of things. If you can, can build them in your app, and you probably need to build them in from day one, really think about it. How are you gonna debug these kind of things, or what are you gonna do when, when things go wrong? If you build it in, that's the things which are really golden, at least in, uh, in my experience. And that's about it for me. Um, I would say, keep it in mind, you can really simplify your life debugging, and that's it. I guess it's time for questions.